For thousands millennia, humans have looked up at the night sky to gaze upon the moon, the one thing that didn't twinkle like a star or shine like the sun. It's fascinated civilizations for as long as we've been able to gaze upwards, enough to finally inspire a group of people to leave Earth and venture to the moon itself, to walk across its surface and find out what truly could be up there. After decades of research, we finally made it to our closest planetary neighbour. We found plenty of rock and dust, but not much else that we didn't already expect to be strewn across the satellite. At least, that's what most of society believes. In reality, the moon is much more complex than a simple sphere of grey dirt. It's a tool astronomers have been using for years to decipher more about the history of Earth and our place in the solar system in addition to the fascinating origin story of the daughter of Thea herself. Contrary to what you've learned in the years since man first landed on the moon, the aforementioned space rock is so much more than just a rock. Sure, there aren't underground creatures laying dormant underneath the moon's many craters, nor are there ancient technologies of a moon civilization that show proof of life away from Earth. But just because our wildest fantasies didn't come true on or after humans first landed on the moon in 1969, doesn't mean there's not more that meets the eye. Everyone knows the Moon's gravitational relationship with the Earth affects the rising and lowering of our water's tides. But did you also know the Moon affects the tides of our crust as well? Obviously, the appearance of our solid tides doesn't change as drastically as the oceans, but the hard surfaces of our crust do move a few centimetres each day, depending on the time and location of our biggest satellite. Our moon also comes with its own natural disasters, albeit much less destructive ones. On Earth, we deal with earthquakes, disruptive shakings of the planet's surface where faults shift and energy dispersed through the lithosphere creates seismic waves, whereas the moon features what we call moonquakes. Moonquakes are caused by a multitude of reasons, such as tidal changes or the expansion of its crust when exposed to sunlight after enduring weeks of frigid temperatures and shrinking effects. While earthquakes are usually short in nature, only lasting about 30 seconds to a minute, moonquakes last much longer, from anywhere between 10 to 30 minutes. And unbeknownst to most average citizens, is the fact the moon is actually drifting away from the earth as we speak. Every year the Moon moves about 3.8 centimetres away from our home planet, which may seem like nothing in the grand scheme of our universe, but it is departing nonetheless. The cause is actually due to the tides we just discussed previously. When the oceanic tides are raised, it creates an effect known as dragging, in which the Earth's spin rate is slowed down. Because this results in a loss of angular momentum, the Moon's orbit speeds up, and in turn, causes the slow drift away from us. The thought of the Moon slowly leaving its proximity to Earth is probably a distressing and depressing feeling. The image of a night sky without the brightness of the Moon's smile, a depleting one. It probably leaves you wondering why. Why does the Moon have such a close relationship with the Earth? Why does it harbour so many similarities to our home planet? And why is it moving away from us at all, via a timeline that doesn't fit with the theories of how our universe was born in the first place? To find a better understanding of the Moon, one must go back to its origins, to take a look at how its birth might better explain its future, and how that may also inform us a little bit more on what our own planet was like millions of years before humans walked the Earth. The first widely accepted proposition for the Moon's birth came in 1989 when astronomer George Darwin, the second son of renowned biologist Charles Darwin, theorised that the Moon and the Earth were once of the same object. 
he stated the moon was thrust from the Earth in a molten state due to centrifugal force, which would explain the moon's slow but sure orbit away from Earth over millions of years. About 50 years after Darwin's musings were used by the scientific community, geologist Reginald Oldworth Daly of Harvard University challenged this theory, claiming it didn't hold up when attempting to solve the reverse mechanics of the moon's path back to Earth. Instead, Daly suggested the moon was created from the impact of a smaller object hitting Earth. This new theory wasn't considered by many until 1975, when astronomers William K. Hartman and Donald R. Davis published their journal titled Icarus, in which they speculate the origin of the moon was born from a giant impact event. They go on to explain that during the final years of the planet-forming period, satellite-sized bodies were zipping through the galaxy, many of which could have impacted the already formed planets. They pointed to the unique geological properties of the moon, and how those could be linked to the coalition of dust and debris that was ejected after the impact's blast. These findings were again supported later on by the North American astronomers Alistair G. W. Cameron and William R. Ward, who theorised that a Mars-sized object collided with Earth due to tangential impact and this object's silicates, meaning matter such as silicone or oxygen or various salts would vaporise. The object's core would then join with the core of the Earth, leaving the remaining vapours to either jettison out of the solar system due to their volatility, or coalesce back into Earth's orbit. These physical particles would first form a belt around the planet, before eventually forming what we know presently as the Moon. This theory would also explain why the Moon is deficient in iron, and features a much lower density than Earth. By the autumn of 1984, at a lunar conference in Kona, Hawaii, astronomers from all walks of life finally came to two decisions. That they either agreed with the giant impact hypothesis, or they did not. It became the leading theory on how the moon came to be, and the newfound focus centred on exactly how the giant impact materialised. This has dominated astronomy's research of the moon's origin through the present day. Specifically, the modern-day giant impact theory postulates that between 4.4 and 4.5 billion years ago, a mere 100 million years after our solar system began to form, a planet the size of Mars crashed into Earth at its final stages of creation. The impact came at an oblique angle of about 45 degrees, and the Mars-like planet was thought to be moving at speeds of 2.5 miles per second, rushing upwards to nearly 6 miles per second, just before making contact with Earth. One of the main points of contention with the giant impact theory is the proliferation of oxygen isotopes in modern-day lunar rock. For the Moon to withhold so many of these isotopes, it would mean that the Mars-like planet and Earth would have had to make impact at a steeper angle than 45 degrees, as well as undergo an intense mixing before the materials re-entered the atmosphere and created an accretion disk around Earth. Because each planet in our solar system all have such various levels of oxygen isotopes, it wouldn't make sense for the Mars-like planet to contain identical numbers to Earth without their physical properties blending together. However, the solution to this problem makes more sense when considering an intense mixing would mean the Mars prototype planet's core would sink into the Earth's core. This would also explain the lack of iron on the Moon, despite it being the result of a once-intact, terrestrial planet. The mantle of the Mars-like object would also have accreted mostly into the Earth's mantle, and everything that was ejected would have either entered an orbit around Earth, or an orbit around the Sun. Astronomers think this would have consisted of around 20% of the Mars-like planet's total mass. This material ejection, transformed into an accreted disk with a sustained orbit, would have happened in stages, eventually producing at least one moon when approximately 50% of the debris vaporised, and the other half coalesced into a satellite rock. We say at least one moon, 
because scientists still aren't sure if there were multiple moons formed from the accretion disk in its third stage of evolution. It's very possible a second moon, about 650 miles in diameter, was born at a Lagrange point with the moon, a point equidistant from the Earth as the moon was. This second moon would have orbited the Earth for millions of years until both it and the first moon drifted far enough away from our home planet, as the solar tides would have pushed the moons out of a Lagrange orbit and towards direct paths of each other. Eventually, the second moon would have slowly made impact with the first moon and latched onto its far side, the side we cannot see from below here on Earth. It would give reason to the fact that the dark side of the moon features a much thicker crust than its near side. This bulkier surface would have prevented volcanic eruptions from creating Luna Maria, the large basaltic plains we can see across the near side surface which are notably missing from the far side. So where could an object the size of Mars come from to create such a unique set of circumstances? Astronomers look to a planet they now call Thea, one of the many potential planets to exist billions of years ago in the early timeline of our solar system, only to be lost to the gravitational effects of the planets still orbiting our sun today. To better understand the origin of the moon, we must first look at the origin of the planet that birthed her, the planet known in the scientific community as Thea, derived its moniker from the Greek Titanus of the same name. Thea was one of the twelve titans born by the earth goddess Gaia and the sky god Uranus. She herself is the goddess of sight, but also the goddess of the brilliance of gems, including gold and silver the one who gave these precious materials their shine and inherent value. One of her siblings, Hyperion, god of the sun, fathered with her three titans and titanesses, Helios, god of the sun, Eos, goddess of the dawn, and Selene, goddess of the moon. Thus, the mother of the moon laid down her legacy, and her name was the only one that made sense when a theoretical planet was considered for the real birth of the moon. An early theory revolving around Thea labelled her as an Earth Trojan rather than a full-sized planet. Earth Trojans are asteroids that are found near Earth with an orbit around the Sun, falling outside of the solar system's main asteroid belt. Most people assume asteroids and planets are separate entities. However, the technical definition of an asteroid is a minor planet. Bigger asteroids are even called planetoids, and usually consist of many rich and volatile surfaces made up of metals and other precious materials. Whether Thea was a Trojan or a planetoid is a pointless argument. Either way, she was estimated to be the size of Mars, if not bigger, with some astronomers postering Thea was actually the same size as Earth. During the early planet formation phase, she would have formed in the L4 or L5 configuration of orbit, a Lagrange point with Earth as they both rotated around the Sun. A few million years later, the gravitational perturbations of Jupiter, Venus, or both, completely changed the course of Thea, and she was most likely thrust into Earth's direct line of orbit. This then led to the collision, where most of Thea melded with Earth as the two still molten planets joined as one before their remnants returned to space. There are other theories of Thea's origin and how she may have impacted Earth's ultimate fate. In a study published in 2019, astronomers raised theories that placed Thea's birth in the outer solar system, amongst Jupiter and Saturn, or even as far as Neptune. They stated their belief that if Thea was rich in volatile materials, she could have been made up of carbonaceous chondrites meteorites with high quantities of organic compounds. Thus, if Thea was born in the outer solar system, its compounds would have remained solid due to its greater distance from the Sun. Then when Thea made its way towards Earth due to gravitational perturbations, it crashed into Earth and added high volumes of water molecules. These theories conclude that Thea is actually the original source for most of modern-day Earth's water supply and the reason behind the dark side of the moon containing traces of ice, 
as well as the moon's two eternally shadowed poles. It's not a theory held by the vast majority of astronomers, but it does pose an interesting, if not alternative theory. While the giant impact theory remains the most popular theory to date, there are a few other hypotheses considered by many different sectors of astronomers. The first is the capture theory. This line of thinking comes from the irregularities of the moon's size, tidal locking, and overall orbit, as some believe that had the primitive Earth wielded a thicker, larger atmosphere, it could have pulled the moon into its gravitational field while preventing a collision, a process known as aerobraking. However, the identical oxygen isotope readings between the moon and Earth mostly discredits this theory. Another theory now considered discredited is the Fisher theory, made popular by George Darwin as previously discussed. One of the key points used to support it was the Pacific Ocean, whose oceanic crust is only about 200 million years old. It was thought this unknown origin was actually a scar where the moon was ejected from. However, after understanding further the age of the moon and how its crust matches more of the Earth's mantle, the Fisher theory was all but ruled out. A couple of other smaller, yet still viable theories is that the Earth and Moon were part of a double system and formed from the accretion disk of the solar system's birth, or even a black hole. This has been mostly ruled out, as it doesn't explain the angular momentum of the pair's relationship, nor for the lack of iron in the Moon's core compared to Earth's. The other is that the Moon was born from a nuclear explosion within the Earth's outer core and mantle, back during its primitive timeline. Had there been enough radioactive elements such as thorium and uranium, centrifugal force could have led to such an event. These types of explosions have been observed, albeit on a much smaller scale, here on Earth, so it wouldn't be all that surprising if a similar experience happened back when the Earth's surface was much more volatile. Regardless of how it arrived in our solar system, or how it became our largest satellite, it's fair to say, the Moon is a special object in its own right. It isn't a mere grey rock floating aimlessly above us, but rather a tool full of mystery and wonder, a potential telescope into the answers of how we got here, and why Earth is the way it is. Until we can figure out how to unlock it, we'll continue to admire its place in the cosmos, an important reminder that even though the most violent and gargantuan of events, beauty and brilliance can emerge.